and welcome back everybody. We have a brand new trial for you this week out of Laredo, Texas. A Border Patrol officer there faces the death penalty for charges connected to the deaths of his alleged mistress and their 20 month old son. Ronald Burgos Aviles had a child with 28 year old Griselda Hernandez. Now at the time he was living with another woman who he also shared children with. In March of 2018, Hernandez reportedly served the defendant child support documents at his workplace. A month later, investigators say that Hernandez asked the defendant to meet her at a local park after he said he wanted to see their almost two-year-old son. Prosecutors believe that the defendant stabbed Hernandez and the little boy to death on that visit. Burgos Aviles is pleading not guilty to capital murder charges. On Monday, attorneys gave their opening statements to the jury. Prosecutors presented their theory of motive in the case, and the defense team described the case as an anomaly for their client. Griselda did what the right that every young woman has who becomes pregnant when there's a father who does not want to make himself responsible. She exercised her right to go to the Texas Attorney General and begin the process. You will see the evidence of her trying to say, hey, help me out. Help me out. March the 21st, that was already set. You're going to see evidence that that train was moving. That legal proceeding had already started. And then something happens that had never happened before. Something happens. He says, I want to meet, I want to meet Dominic. He tells Griselda, in a few weeks, I don't think you're going to want to be my friend. Real subtle. The evidence will show that the meeting that he's setting up for them is not at the park, but it is in a dense, brushy area near the Rio Grande River. Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles is lying and wait. He is hiding, waiting for her to get close enough to the truck to carry out his ambush. In April 9, uh, 2018, Ronald, who has no prior criminal history whatsoever, was accused of the murders of Griselda and Dominic Hernandez. This is an enormous anomaly, an aberration in Ronald's otherwise normal law-abiding life. He will die in prison regardless of whether you impose the death penalty or not, because the only other available penalty is life in prison without the possibility of parole. I want to start with the defense, Brian. They gave maybe a five-minute opening very quick. What would you think of that? I wasn't a fan of it. Uh, hey, stylistically, we're different. I get it. I'm not going to criticize that. But you go through this, I'm a zealous advocate. You talk about the punishment. I mean, we're opening statements here. Why are you talking about, hey, he's either going to die in prison or be getting the death penalty? You might as well just take a plea there and throw in the towel. Then he brings up the cell phone towers and how it's not accurate. That's when he started to pull me in. It's like, oh, are you going to say that he's here and the crime happened there? That's great. But then he just walked past that and said, okay, that's it. It was a cross between a non-opening opening and this almost throwing in the towel with maybe one issue. And I'm just like, I don't know what you're going to do here. Let's see what you got. You make a good point. I, I was a bit uh, taken off by that as well. Um, I do want to talk to you about the investigation, Mark, because it apparently only took police about an hour to piece together that the defendant was the suspect. Do you think that strengthens or weakens the prosecution's case? It could go either way. Now, I've prosecuted death penalty cases. I'm here to tell you the jury spends much more time focusing on details like that because they know it's much more important than a random felony case. Some of those jurors might think that the police got it in their head that it was him early on and that they weren't able to change their mind. You could see the defense bringing that up. Having said that, for many jurors who are accustomed to watching TV dramas where the suspect is identified rather quickly, perhaps this will make sense to them. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. I, I mean, look, we're still at the beginning stages of this, and obviously trials are kind of flexible and malleable, and they can switch all the way. I will tell you one thing. It's just a really sad case when you think about what happened to that woman and her son, and uh, it'll be interesting to see 
what the defense will mount up because it looks like some significant evidence against their client. And welcome back. We're closing out today's show with a wild story from Chicago. A woman and her teenage son were both charged with murder after the mother reportedly signaled for her son to shoot a man. Now, prosecutors are moving to drop those same charges. Investigators say Carlicia Hood was inside Maxwell Street Express, a 24-hour restaurant, to get some food while her 14-year-old stayed in the car. Now, a man came into the business, and he and Hood got into an argument. Hood reportedly texted her son, signaling to him to bring a gun into the store. The argument between Hood and the man turned physical, and Hood was allegedly punched in the head multiple times. Hood's son then fired the gun at the man, hitting him in the back. The man ran away, but the teen apparently followed him, firing more shots. Hood also apparently wanted her son to shoot a bystander who was laughing at the situation, but the shooter and his mother got back into the car and drove off. The 32-year-old victim died from two gunshot wounds to the back. Hood and her son turned themselves into police last week, and they both faced felony murder charges, but prosecutors say emerging evidence has motivated them to drop the charges. While that evidence isn't entirely clear, a viral video surfaced online over the weekend showing Hood indeed being punched by the victim. Now, Mark, are, are you surprised that the mother and son were charged, maybe in the first place, because someone could say this is defense of others? Yeah, everybody here was acting stupidly in some respect. This was overcharged to begin with. Remember, a dismissal of charges, the prosecutor could still bring other charges. There is no underlying forcible felony that I can see, and you can't charge felony murder in Illinois without a forcible felony. That's probably the charging mistake. There's probably another charge coming because shooting people in the back is usually a bad idea. You've got a duty to retreat. And the notion that you tell your son to shoot someone who's laughing suggests real problem for this mother. The mother's got more criminal liability here than the son, I think. I, I think the idea of her allegedly saying shoot somebody else who was merely laughing doesn't help the case at all for her. But I am curious, Brian, what do you think caused prosecutors to change their mind? Because I, I'll say it seemed like a, kind of a tough case when you're dealing with a young person, 14 years old. But I, I agree with Mark. It seemed the more responsibility was put on the mother. But what do you think caused prosecutors to ultimately change their mind? Yeah, I wish we had more time on this because during the break, Mark and I were talking, and I agree with Mark. He's, he's saying, hey, they're, they're dismissing the charge, but they could bring it back. Well, for me, I, I think, and, and I'm not saying one more right than the other, I'm just presenting the two ideas. I think the court of public opinion really swayed the prosecutors to say, hey, the writing on the wall is you're not going to get a jury to convict. Now, do I think they wouldn't get the conviction for the son? I think that's very typical. I'll take that case in a heartbeat. 80-20 says you probably win that case. But the mother... That one, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure why they would have dismissed it against her when you say she's basically pointing out to go and murder, 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 the witness, chase after this guy and kill. So I think Mark has some strong points that they could refile later, but I also think equally that maybe the writing's on the wall that people in Chicago are not going to go after someone who's beating up a mother and a 14-year-old son comes to protect with a gun. Real quick, Brian, 10 seconds. That's what you think emerging evidence was? I think that's what it is. I don't think there's anything more than that. All right. Brian, Mark, thank you so much. And everyone out there, thanks for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We're going to see you next time as we discuss justice in America.